A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy and this is Nidhan. So today, 6th July 2024, we have a list of articles for the discussion. So you can see the list of articles behind me. So let's begin with the first one. So you can see this article is talking about the recent outbreak of African swine flu in the Trishur district of Kerala state. So followed by the report of this virus, the district authority of Trishur ordered to kill 310 pigs in the private farm. And the district authority also declared 1 km radius as disease hit and 10 km radius as disease surveillance area. So this is the crux of this article and with this we will understand more about the African swine flu from prelims point of view. The African swine flu is a highly contagious and deadly virus. This disease affects both domestic as well as feral swines of all ages. Swine means pigs, feral means animals existing in a wild or untamed state. It is endemic to sub-Saharan Africa but has spread to many other regions of the world, including Asia and Europe. It leads to an acute form of hemorrhagic fever and the mortality rate is unfortunately nearly 100% because it has no cure. The only way to prevent the further spread of this disease is killing the animals. But another important feature of this virus is it cannot be spread from pigs to humans. Now let's see what is the cause for African swine flu. African swine flu is caused by a large DNA virus of Aspheravida family. This disease comes under the transboundary animal disease. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the transboundary animal diseases may be defined as those epidemic diseases which are highly contagious or transmissible and have potential for a very rapid spread irrespective of national boundaries and it can also cause serious socio-economic and possibly public health consequences. So, African swine flu being a transboundary disease causes severe economic and production loss. Okay, now let us discuss how it spreads. The African swine fever spreads by live or dead pigs, domesticated or wild and also through pork products. It spreads through direct contact with the infected pigs through uh, its feces or body fluids and also through indirect contact via formators such as equipment, vehicles or people who work with pigs without biosecurity. So far, there is no approved vaccine against the African swine flu. Historically, the outbreak of this virus have been reported in Africa and parts of Europe, South America and the Caribbean regions. African swine flu is found in countries around the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. More recently, it has spread through China, Mongolia and Vietnam, as well as within parts of European Union. See, African swine flu is a disease listed in the World Organization for Animal Health, Terrestrial Animal Health Code. So, if this disease is found, it should be reported immediately. And World Organization for Animal Health is an intergovernmental organization responsible for improving animal health worldwide. World Organization for Animal Health develops normative documents relating to the rules that member countries can use to protect themselves from the introduction of diseases and pathogens. India is a member of World Organization for Animal Health. So, with this, we will move on to the next article about the bird flu. So we have seen African swine flu. Now we are going to discuss another virus that affects the birds that is bird flu or avian flu. So this article talks about the recent outbreak of bird flu in Kutanad region of Kerala. So we will look into this article. Kutanad region in Kerala is experiencing a severe bird flu outbreak that has spread beyond poultry to infect various wild birds like crow, kites, pigeons and herons. This is raising concerns about human infections and recent significant Im economic impact. See, this outbreak started in April when duck farmer Abraham Osep started noticing that his flock started dying suddenly. Rapid response teams have since culled nearly 1,71,000 birds to contain the spread. Measures are being taken to prevent human infections, but the outbreak has already caused substantial losses for local farmers. This is the crux of this article. In our discussion, we are going to see about avian flu from prelims point of view. See, avian flu is a highly contagious viral disease. It affects a variety of birds including birds that we consume such as chickens, ducks, turkeys, quills, etc. Note that it will affect both the pet birds and the wild birds. Moreover, the virus strains such as H5N1 and H7N9 pose a threat to human health as well. But generally, most avian influenza viruses do not affect humans. Now, let's see how it transmitted. There should be a direct contact between infected and healthy birds. It is spread through secretions from nostrils, mouth, eyes, etc. Therefore, it is not airborne. Please note this, the avian influenza is not airborne. It can also spread through contaminated water and feed. Here note, there is no effective vaccine against the bird flu. Then, it is possible for humans to contract the avian influenza viruses from birds. But human-to-human -human contact is much more difficult without prolonged contact. 
now how do we know if the bird is infected there are certain symptoms to confirm that for example swelling in the comb and wattles purple discoloration of the wattles combs and legs diarrhea nasal discharge soft shelled or misshapen eggs decreased egg production coughing and sneezing ruffled feathers etc not very important but we should have an idea about the symptoms let us see how it is controlled in india the central government requires veterinary staff to conduct inspections periodically under the prevention and control of infections and contagious diseases in animals act 2009 the staff looks for any signs of disease among birds and other animals but aquatic wild birds are often found in close proximity to domestic birds near lakes dams and reservoirs this makes it difficult to achieve segregation of birds that's all about this topic and let's move on to the next topic now we are going to discuss an article related to bilateral relations so this article is talking about the upcoming visit of our prime minister to russia the agenda of the visit mostly stresses on bilateral relation and a special mention on ukraine conflict for peaceful resolution with this backdrop let's focus on certain area that are relevant for our upsc prelims and mains even in 2020 mains a upsc mains question based on indo russian relation was asked and with the changing geopolitical dynamics so there is a high probability that these kind of questions will appear in the future also aspirants we don't have to go deep into the political background which is irrelevant for our exam but rather we should focus on indo russian relation in a brief and recent developments along with inherent challenges therein and also what are the way forward to ensure indo russian solidarity let's start with a brief background on indo russian relation along with the contemporary trends see india and russia shares a historically strong and multifaceted partnership characterized by mutual trust respect and cooperation across various sectors firstly let's see about the historical ties indo russian relationship dates back to the cold war era with the soviet union being a significant ally to india the treaty of peace friendship and cooperation was signed in the year 1971 marks the landmark of bilateral ties between the two nations here note that in wake of indo pak war in 1971 russia supported india while the us and china supported pakistan More importantly in 2000 the relation was elevated to a strategic partnership and in 2010 it was further upgraded to a special and privileged strategic partnership this signifies the depth and the breadth of the cooperation in the sphere of defense russia is the largest supplier of defense equipments to india accounting for almost 68% of india's defense import between 2012 and 2016 and 62% between 2013 and 2018 Key agreements include the procurement of S400 missile systems, BrahMos missile collaboration and joint military exercises like Indra. Russia is also a key partner in India's energy security, supplying crude oil, LNG and nuclear fuel. The Kudangulam nuclear power plant is a prime example of bilateral cooperation in the nuclear sector. Now coming to the economic engagement, Russia is India's seventh biggest trading partner. The bilateral trade has reached US dollar 45 billion already surpassing the target of bilateral trade of US dollar 30 billion by 2025. The two countries intend to increase bilateral investment US dollar 50 billion by 2025. Space is another significant area of cooperation with the joint projects and satellite launches strengthening ties. India and Russia have collaborated on space exploration projects including the Chandrayaan 1 to the moon. On the geopolitical level, both Russia and India support the concept of multipolar world. It suits a rising Russia which aspires to recover the great power status and the rising India which aspires to get a permanent seat in the United Nations Security Council and enhance its status in the global arena. And also Moscow has long supported India's desire to expand the circle of permanent members of the Security Council and to enter into the nuclear supplies group which Beijing is blocking. Now moving forward let's see what are the inherent challenges we have in Indo Russian relations. Firstly India's growing strategic and defense ties with the United States particularly through the Quad that is quadrilateral security dialogue have raised concerns in Moscow about a potential shift in India's foreign policy alignment. Here it is important to note that Russia's increasingly close relation with China particularly in the context of Indo-China border tensions create a complex geopolitical environment for India. Secondly, India is diversifying its defense procurement sources, reducing its dependence on Russia. This includes buying from other countries like US say France and Israel we can sell long standing indo russian defense ties the us katsa that is countering america's adversaries through sanctions act possess a risk of sanctions on india for purchasing 
major defense systems like S400 missiles from Russia which complicates Indian engagement with the Russian counterparts further. Thirdly, India has now signed all four fundamental agreements with the USA. Thirdly, India has now signed all four foundational agreements with the USA. This creates the dilemma to choose between comprehensive global strategic partnership with the USA on one hand and its special and privileged partnership with Russia on the other hand. Fourthly, Russian invasion of Ukraine raised a question on India's stand on non-violence and non-alignment in several multilateral forum. See, despite the challenges, the future of India-Russia relations looks promising with the continued cooperation in emerging areas like artificial intelligence, cyber security, and arctic region strengthening people to people contacts and cultural exchanges will also enhance mutual understanding and goodwill india russia relations are robust and resilient built on solid foundation of historical ties and strategic convergence the partnership is poised to evolve further adapting to the changing global and regional dynamics so that's all about this topic and with this we will move on to the next article now we are going to discuss an important article related to the international relations this article is talking about the recent un report which says that nearly 30000 migrants have been reported dead or missing while attempting to cross the mediterranean to reach the europe in the last decade and the situation is worse for those who traveling through africa to reach the coast this article as per the report from the un agencies and the mixed migration center refugees and migrants face severe violence abuse and exploitation on land routes across africa to reach the mediterranean More deaths are believed to occur on these land routes than at sea. 1,180 people were known to have died while crossing the Sahara Desert from 2020 to 2024. According to the estimation of International Organization for Migration, an average of 5 people are dying on the desert routes. In this context, let us see the challenges faced by the refugees, treaties related to the refugees crisis and also about the refugee crisis in India. First, we will discuss what are the challenges faced by the refugees. Violence and persecutions. Refugees often flee their home countries due to various reasons such as war, ethnic cleansing, political persecution and human rights abuse. So they cannot return back to their country. And second, lack of basic needs. Many refugees suffer from lack of basic needs such as food, water, shelter and access to medical care. and third legal and social barriers refugees often encounter difficulties in obtaining legal status work permits access to education and healthcare in host countries fourth psychological trauma the experience of violence loss and uncertainty can lead to long term psychological issues such as post traumatic stress disorder like that moving on Let us see refugee crisis in India. India faces its own refugee challenges dealing with both historical and contemporary issues. If we look at the historical context, India has long hosted refugees including people from Tibet since 1959 Tibetan uprising and people from Bangladesh following the 1971 Topak war and more recently India has seen an influx of Rohingya refugees fleeing persecution in Myanmar. The situation has been controversial with the debates over security, legal status and humanitarian obligations. During the Sri Lankan civil war many Tamil people from the Sri Lanka sought asylum in India particularly in the state of Tamil Nadu since 1980s India has also hosted people from Afghanistan and from 2015 the Nepal was struck by a devastating earthquake forcing thousands of Nepalis to flee the open border into India for safety and assistance many sought refuges in states like Bihar and Uttar Pradesh India's long and porous borders with the neighboring countries added with the lack of comprehensive refugee policy have made it challenging to manage effectively and regulate the influx of refugees now let us see the policy and the legal framework okay now let us see the policy and the legal framework first citizenship act 1955 this act provides provisions for renunciation termination and deprivation of indian citizenship okay second citizenship amendment act 2019 seeks to provide a pathway to citizenship for persecuted hindu christian jain parsi sikh and buddhist immigrants from bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan however muslim immigrants from these two countries have been excluded third the foreigners act of 1946 this empowers the central government to detain and deport illegal foreign nationals present in the country here important thing to note that india is not a signatory to the 1951 refugee convention or the 1967 protocol refugees in india are governed by various domestic laws which do not always provide clear protections or rights without a specific legal framework for the refugees their status and rights can be uncertain leading to challenges in accessing basic services and employment but india provides varying levels of assistance to refugees through government program and ngos now we are going to see 
see why India did not sign the 1951 Refugee Convention. These are the reasons for that. First, the definition of the refugee. The 1951 Convention defines refugees as individuals deprived of their civil and political rights but not their economic rights. India believes that this definition is too narrow as it excludes those who flee due to economic deprivation or lack of livelihood opportunities. The next reason is Eurocentrism. India sees 1951 Refugee Convention as Eurocentric focusing mainly on European concerns and situations at the time it was drafted. The convention does not address the specific challenges and context faced by the South Asian countries like India regarding refugee influxes and cross-border movements. So this is why India has not ratified the UN Refugee Convention. Lastly, now we are going to see the concerns regarding refugees. Firstly, security concerns. The presence of refugees has sometimes raised security concerns, particularly in the case of Rohingya, leading to calls for stricter immigration controls. Second, integration and social tension. Integrating refugees into local communities can be challenging and may sometimes lead to social tensions, especially in areas with limited resources. So the best example is the northeastern region of India. India's approach to the refugee crisis involves balancing humanitarian concerns with the national security and socio-economic considerations. Thirdly, resource strain. The influx of refugees can lead to strain on the local resources, including housing, healthcare, and education, particularly in areas that are already economically disadvantaged. So these are the concerns related to refugees. As India up upholds the principle Vasudeva Kudumbagam, we should take long-term action in addressing refugee crisis. So that's all about this article. And now we are going to discuss the next article related to Assam flood. Okay, this news article is about the flood crisis in Assam has reached catastrophic levels and it also led to the displacement of over 24 lakh people across 30 of the state's 35 districts. The relentless Brahmaputra and other 12 rivers have busted their banks, leaving devastation in their wake. Okay, the rescue efforts are going on, but the human toll and the ecological damage continue to mount. Let us quickly go through the geography of the northeastern region of India through our mains and the writing discussion. Let me read out the question for you. Discuss the unique geographical and and climatic factors of northeastern India that makes it susceptible to natural disasters and how can effective disaster management strategies be tailored to address these challenges. So this question can be asked in UPSC mains GS paper 3 under the syllabus disaster management. It can also be asked in the geography part. Let's see how to approach this question. First you can give a basic introduction about the northeastern part of India and moving on to the first part of the body of the answer. Here you can write about the unique geographical and climatic factors of northeast India and that makes it susceptible to the natural disasters. And then in the second part, you can write about the effective disaster management strategies. This is how we are going to address this question. Moving on to the intro part, here you can write that in Northeast India, fondly called the land of seven sisters, represents both geographic and political administrative division of the country. Northeastern Indian states are blessed with a wide range of physiographic and eco-climatic conditions and the geographical gateway for much of India's endemic flora and fauna. However, they are highly prone to natural disasters due to its unique geographical and climatical factors. Some of them are as follows. This way you can give a connection between the intro part and main body of the answer. In the first part of the body, you can write about what are the geographical and climatic factors that makes the Northeast India susceptible to natural disasters. First, the region lies in a seismically active zone, making it prone to the earthquakes. The collision of Indian plate with the Eurasian plate leads to frequent seismic activities. As you can see in this map, Northeast is in very high risk zone. Secondly, the terrain. It is predominantly mountainous with steep slopes and dense forests. This increases the vulnerability of landslides and flash floods, especially during the monsoon season. Example, Assam in northeast India features flat terrain surrounded by Brahmaputra and Barak rivers originating from the Himalayas. So whenever monsoon rain occurs, it gets collected and flows towards the plain regions of Assam. This is the reason why Assam is the most hit region due to the river rain floods. Third, the region experiences heavy rainfall during the monsoon, leading to river floods. Cyclones originating in the Bay of Bengal also affect coastal areas, exacerbating flood risk. For instance, the region experiences an average rainfall ranging from 2500 mm to 3800 mm annually. This rainfall occurs predominantly during the southwest monsoon period, which extends from June to September. Fourth, due to its proximity to the Himalayan ranges, they are also prone to floods caused by the glacial lake outburst events. For example, the recent breach of the South Lohank 
lake coastal floods in Sikkim state of India. Apart from this, the rich biodiversity and extensive forest cover in the northeast India are assets but also pose challenges during the natural disasters like wildfires and forest related hazards. These are the certain unique geographical and climatic factors of northeastern India. Moving on to the second part of the body, some of the effective disaster management strategies for northeast India should be tailored to address these challenges and this includes establishing robust early warning systems for earthquakes, landslides, floods and cyclones can help alert communities in advance allowing for timely evacuation and preparation. Secondly, improving infrastructure such as roads, bridges and communication networks to enhance accessibility to remote areas. Okay, this can facilitate rapid response and relief operations. For example, implementation of Bharat Mala Pariyojana for road infrastructure. Third, conducting regular drills. This includes raising awareness about disaster risk and training local communities in first aid and basic rescue techniques. This can improve their resilience. Fourth, implementing sustainable forest management practices and integrating biodiversity conservation with disaster risk reduction can mitigate the impact of wildfires and its related hazards. Finally, strengthening the capacity of local governments, NGOs and volunteers in disaster response and management through training programs and resource allocation is crucial. So, to sum it up, the Indian government strives to promote a national resolve to mitigate the damage and destruction caused by the natural and man-made disasters through sustained and collective efforts. In that line, the approval to the National Disaster Management Authority's upscaling of Abda Mitra scheme to train, equip and ensure 1 lakh volunteers in disaster response is a right move in the right direction. This should be further accomplished by adopting a technology-driven, proactive, multi-hazard and multi-sectoral strategy for building a safer, disaster silent and dynamic India. So this is the conclusion of this article. With this, we are concluding the article about Assam flood. With this, we are moving on to the prelims practice question. So the first question is about heat waves. So the question is, which of the following are the common causes for heat waves? Okay, first, high atmospheric pressure. Second, urban heat islands. Third, prolonged dry weather. Four, absence of cloud cover. Select the correct answer using the code given below. A. 1, 2 and 3 only. B. 1, 2 and 4 only. C. 2, 3 and 4 only. D. 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. So the correct answer is option D. 1, 2, 3 and 4 only. We will read the explanation. Heat waves often occur when high pressure system becomes stationary over a region, leading to sinking air and clear skies, which allow for maximum heating of earth surface. Clear skies allow sunlight to directly reach the earth surface, leading to increased heating and elevated temperature during the day. This means the statement 1 and 4 are correct. Statement 2 is also correct. Urban areas can become significantly warmer than their rural surroundings due to human activities, buildings and reduced vegetation contributing to heat wave conditions. Similarly, lack of rain and dry conditions can reduce soil moisture, making it easier for temperatures to rise and stay high over a period. So statement 3 is also correct. And the second question is about African swine fever. So the question is, with reference to African swine fever, consider the following statements. Statement 1. African swine fever is a threat to human health and can be transmitted from pigs to humans. Statement 2. The virus is highly resistant in the environment and can survive on cloth, boots, wheels and other materials. Which of the following statements given above is correct? Option A. 1 only. Option B. 2 only. Option C. Both 1 and 2. Option D. Neither 1 nor 2. And the answer is option B. So from the today's discussion itself, we know that the statement 1 is wrong because of the African swine flu, that virus will not easily transmitted from pigs to humans. But it can resist in the environment and can survive on cloth, boots, wheels and other materials. Of the following statements is or are correct. Viruses can infect bacteria, fungi, plants. Select the correct answer using the code given below. So option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 3 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. Option D, 1, 2 and 3. So the correct answer is option D, 1, 2 and 3. So the viruses can infect bacteria, fungi and even plants. So today we have discussed articles. If any questions comes from this area, try to make no mistake. Even if you make any mistake, it's totally fine because just remember, why do we fall? So we can learn and pick ourselves up. So that's it. That's all for today. And after that, a mains question will be displayed on the screen. Try to answer it. And before leaving this channel, don't forget to subscribe and like. And also share this content with your friends and make the competition more healthy. Thank you.